Hi, everybody. Today we're at the Confederate Air Force Air Show at Gillespie Field in El Cajon. And this is Bob Newmeyer, the head honcho chief <laughs> president. Uh, what is your title, Bob? Uh, I'm just the ringleader or wing leader or something like that. Ringleader yeah. or wing leader. Yeah, right? something like that. Uh, of the Confederate Air Force, the local chapter. Now, this is a local chapter. Right, Air Tell Group our, One. Tell our viewers about Air Group One, the local chapter. Okay, Air Group One is a local chapter of the Confederate Air Force out of Midland, Texas. We have uh, two hangars here at Gillespie Field. We have two airplanes, an uh, SNJ and an L-5. And uh, we have about 50 members, and uh, we'd like everybody to come out. We meet every Saturday at Gillespie at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, we'd like to have everybody come out, everybody join. If you don't want to join, just come out. And, and uh, be part of the group. Uh, we eat peanuts, uh, drink pop, and tell a lot of lies. And uh, we got people from every uh, war, war uh, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. We just have a great time. Come on out. That's true. Now, one of your members is uh, John McGrewer, uh, who was a RAF pilot in World War II. Right. And then you have another member who was a, a Nazi German Luftwaffe pilot. Right. Now, you've you got to be careful when you say Nazi. They were not Nazis. They were just Luftwaffe pilots. All right. Yeah. Hey, he flew in the Luftwaffe from 39 to 45. We also have John Asmussen, who was a 50-mission tail gunner in a B-17. Who, uh, had now, seven. he's the one who, who flew 25 missions, and instead of coming home, he signed up for another 25 well, missions. Well, he didn't sign up. They told him he could do 25, then they could go home. At the end of 25, they said, oh, by the way, we don't have anybody to do the next 25, so you're going to do another 25. So he volunteered reluctantly for the second 25. So this is an example of the kind of pilots and the kind of people that are in the Confederate Air Force, and unlike wings or some of the other programs that you see on the Discovery Channel. These are real live local people right. and they can come out on Saturdays and meet and talk with these people and ask them questions right. and, and touch airplanes. And be, be part of the guys. When I was a kid I would walk 10 miles to get to stand near an airplane That's right. and now they have an opportunity to come out is it every Saturday isn't Every it? Saturday. Uh, at Gillespie Airport. Now how do they find you at Gillespie Airport? Well, we're down by the tower. Uh, you come down Magnolia and turn, uh, I'd have to see, come down, just head towards the tower and you'll see big signs out front that says Air Group 1 Confederate Air Force. You can't miss us. All right, we'll they put head, them out every Saturday. They head for the control tower. Right. And there'll be a big sign out there telling them where you are. Right, right. And it's every Saturday morning at plenty, what time? 10 o'clock. The meeting starts, we have plenty of parking. Very good. The Air Group 1, the local wing, of the Confederate Air Force. This is Tom Cloyd, and he's the pilot of this B-29. Tom, how did you get into flying B-29s? Well, when I, uh, I started with the Confederate Air Force back in uh, getting acquainted with them back in 1978, and I joined the CF in 1980, and this was in the middle of Odessa area, where, by the way, our headquarters is today. And our, that's in Texas. That's in Texas. That's and, where you keep uh, it, right? That's where we keep it when we're not on the road like we're, we are now. We're out in the summertime, five months, five and a half months, and then we're back at home. But anyway. Well, wait a minute. Let's stop a minute. You're on the road five and a half months? That's correct. Now, you can't take off five and a half months from work. So do you have a rotating crew, or we how do. do you do it? We do. People, people keep moving in. We got three or four people coming in today, so all the crew kind of moves around, rotates. We've been out now about two weeks, and after we move to Camarillo, my wife, who is the PX officer, will go back home, and other people come out. And then I'll come back out in about another three weeks and move it another one or two times. So, so uh, it's a constantly it's rotating a, situation. That's correct. Now that requires dedication. Oh yes, it does, and it requires a lot of paperwork too to know who's coming and when and uh, and if and if yeah and if and uh, it takes a lot for our operations officer uh, to set up the flight crews because the flight crews are a lot a lot of them are airline people and they come and go they come in on Sunday move the airplane. Monday and go back home. Okay. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, right now I'm retired, so I can come out and stay as long as I want to, but still we got to let everybody fly the airplane to get some right. time in the airplane. Let's talk about the airplane. Can you tell us about the history of the B-29 airplane? Well, uh, the B-29, of course, the, the airplane started on the drawing board in 1939. 
And uh, I think it's interesting to hear or to know that um, when they were designing the airplane, uh, Washington, or the government, wanted an airplane that would be capable of flying at least 3,000 miles, over 300 miles an hour, carrying a very heavy bomb load, and, uh, and, and would be able to fly very high. So uh, Boeing started the designing of this airplane in 39, and uh, it wound up being able to fly around 350 miles an hour, go upwards to 4,000 miles, carrying 20,000 pounds of bombs and flying into the mid-30,000 feet. Better than the specifications. Better than the specs. In every category. In every category. And it's another interesting thing is that uh, the airplane from the drawing board until the first flight was barely four years, which I don't think we could ever duplicate today again. 39 plus 4 is 43? It uh, first flew in 1942, so uh, we might have to back up and say they started drawing. That's even faster. They started drawing maybe in the late 38s or somewhere in there in 1938. But it's, uh, the and by the way, it's the first pressurized military airplane also. There's pressurization in it because the airplane was capable of flying so high that to keep the people on oxygen for that long of time, 15 hours or so of flying, uh, it is very hard on the body mm -hmm. to stay on oxygen and at high altitudes that length of time. What so is the service ceiling of this airplane? They have flown it into the low 40,000 foot. Now this was just testing to see how high they could fly it and this, that, and the other after the war. That's eight miles high. That's eight miles high, that's correct. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous airplane. And also uh, I'd like to comment on the fact that the government back in 38, 39, you know, Germany was just beginning to be active again, and they were beginning to start uh, taking over countries again. And I have to think that the government probably had to, to at least the thought that we might get in another war, and uh, that since Japan was uh, friendly with Germany, uh, and we weren't getting along real well with the country of Japan at that time, that uh, it might be, when we get involved, it might be with Japan. So and we, the Pacific Ocean is the there. And the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we had to build something that had the range of at least 3,000 miles. The idea being they're going to have to fly at least 1,500 miles to get there to the islands for the homeland of Japan and another 1,500 miles back home. Then it became the responsibility of the Marines and the Army to take the various islands as we step stone our way and finally got into the Marianas. Leapfrog was the, the, uh, leapfrog. the phrase that uh, General MacArthur used. And when we got to the Marianas, that's Guam, Tinian, and Saipan, mm -hmm. that, those three islands became the homes of the B-29s and they were about 1,500 miles from the main island of Japan. And, and of course when, when they got to started. Tinian, that's where uh, the Enola Gay took off from Enola, to bomb Japan. That's correct. The Enola Gay and Boxcar both departed from Tinian. And uh, they departed from what they call Northfield. I just uh, went over to the islands last November, a little tour group with the CAF people, and saw the islands for the first time. And uh, what a great part of history. I mean, I. I'd like to have stayed on Tinian uh, a long, uh, longer than we. Tinian is a very small island, only about 2,500 people on it today. But it was strategic because it, it there was, was a landing strip there. That's correct, and uh, they became uh, there became about eight landing strips there after the Seabees built them all. And at one time, Tinian was considered the busiest airport in the world, just with B-29s and B-24s and other fighters. Let's talk on. a little bit about the specifics of this particular airplane. It's uh, four engines. Tell us about the engines. Well, the engines are the Curtis Wright uh, R3350s and they developed 2,200 horsepower at the time. In each one? In each one. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was the uh, largest engine in the uh, inventory of the military as far as horsepower rating is concerned. Uh, 
the engines have the engines were noted uh, to have a lot of trouble and at first they did have a lot of trouble they had trouble with their cooling and uh, the engines would get hot the exhaust valve would drop uh, you know it would break the exhaust valve that would go down inside the engine and once it started tearing up the internals of the engines then the engine would catch on fire and they had a lot of fire problems and what have you so as the time went on they changed from the carbureted engines into fuel injection and uh, these engines here are fuel injection so and you have uh, and, uh, four fuel injected engines and uh, they all have four bladed propellers that's correct. and they're variable pitch propellers that's correct and uh, they're constant speed variable pitch and they can go to full feather and uh, that is if we ever had uh, lost an engine or an engine went bad and we had to shut it down we can turn the blades all the way and it'll just stop the engine or the, the uh, mm -hmm. propeller from turning from moving from windmilling from, from windmilling if you mm -hmm. had a windmilling propeller it creates a tremendous amount of drag so uh, that's why they go to full feather all right let's talk a little bit about uh, the configuration of the airplane uh, the fuselage and the nose was a departure from uh, most airplanes uh, that's correct the uh, Boeing felt like if they could get uh, they could make a bomber to where the three essentials well actually four were very close together and we're talking about our bombardier that sits right in the nose the captain the co-pilot and the flight engineer all four of these people are right on the flight in a cluster deck, right in, in the nose uh -huh. and uh, that was the idea of all the glass and the nose the way it is and uh, because all four of these uh, very essential people i'm not saying that the fly, uh, that the uh, navigator and the radio operator and the gunner, gunners weren't essential but the flight deck idea of it well, being that the all heart the liver right and the there. kidneys are all essential uh, so they're all right. essential now the uh, the nose is all plexiglass which makes the airplane very vulnerable to machine gun fire but you fly above uh, the ceiling of fighter airplanes, so that's you didn't right. have to worry about attacks from fighters. The last B-29s that uh, came off the assembly line in the late 1945s, just right before war ended, came off without even turrets on them. They didn't put guns on them. Oh, is that right? And uh, in fact, the Enola Gay, the boxcar, all the airplanes at the 509th Squadron, that's uh, Colonel Tibbetts at the time, Colonel Tibbetts, that was his group, the 509th. All those airplanes were built by Martin in Omaha, Nebraska, and none of them had any guns on them except tail gunners. Well, they took off at a friendly airfield and immediately went up to an altitude where nobody could get near them. That's correct. So they really didn't need any. That's correct. And when they dropped their bombs, uh, they turned around and came back. So they were above any enemy airplanes. That's correct. And uh, also, there are those that think that uh, at the same time, I remember this was beginning, this was in August of 45, that the Japanese were conserving everything they had as far as their fighters, their bombers, or an invasion. Yeah. For the invasion. And uh, so they were just taking the bombing, the bombings that the B-29s were dishing out so they could conserve their aircraft, their artillery, their, their people to the best of their ability for the, the invasion of their homeland, which they thought would happen. So. Uh, I have a friend, Japanese lady, and uh, she said she was a little girl uh, during World War II. And in uh, August of 1945, every morning before she went to school, she had to get up and go practice with a pointed stick because they, they were getting ready for the invasion. Mm -hmm. And even down to children with pointed sticks, they were going to fight to the last man, woman, and child. Oh, I think so. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if, you know, if our people in Washington at the Smithsonian would have uh, spent a little bit of time interviewing the real people in Japan, they would have found this out and, and stopped trying to change history and rewrite history and rewrite the books that, uh, oh, we don't think there'd been over uh, as many as 50,000 casualties on the American side and not near what they were saying on the Japanese side. It's and amazing, it's crazy. amazing uh, what the bean counters, uh, there's a saying, uh, he scoffs at scars who has never felt a sword. 
So these bean counters in button-down shirts and striped ties back in the Smithsonian uh, have no idea what warfare and combat is about. Uh, I, I think that uh, they saved a lot of American lives Absolutely. and they saved a lot of Japanese lives uh, who would both sides would have died needlessly. We have a number of Japanese that are CAF members. They come to our air show every year and I cannot tell you by, by man and woman, they bring their wives with them and every one of them has admitted that the dropping of the two atomic bombs saved un a, well, millions. A millions of lives as far as the Japanese were concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then we have people that will sit there and, and write a new text and uh, tell everybody how we were the aggressors. We didn't ask how... for Pearl Harbor. <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing. All you have to do is just talk to the people and uh, they'll tell you. I've, I've made a lot of friends with, the, with uh, several, uh, many of the Japanese people. In the Japanese language, war and attack is the same word. And in Japanese history, they have never declared war on anybody. They always pull a sneak attack first. Mm. They, they, they've never declared war. So we didn't ask for Pearl Harbor. That's correct. Uh, what else would you like to tell us about the airplane? Well, I can tell you a little bit about Fifi if you'd like to All hear right. it. All right, this particular B-29. This particular B-29, mm -hmm. named Fifi, um, it was delivered to the uh, Army Air Corps in July of 1945. So it was a very so late... So it was still during the war. Still uh -huh. during the war. It never saw combat. It, it went to, came out as a trainer, or it went to into service as a trainer. They also serve who only stand and wait their turn. Yes, that's true. And uh, this airplane uh, was uh, active until 1946 or 47. Then they put it in uh, the uh, storage at Powell Army Airfield, which is way out in West Texas. They call it the Rattlesnake Bomber Base, because there was a lot of rattlesnakes out there then. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, excuse me, the airplane stayed in storage at Powell until 1952 during the Korean War, and. Uh, they brought it out of storage and they made it back into a trainer again. And in 1956, the last base it served at was uh, Andrews Air Force, or uh, Randolph Air Force Base. Now wait just a minute. Uh, this plane was used during the Korean War? Yes. Uh, the, and by the way, a lot of people, I'm glad you mentioned this, because a lot of people may not know that the B-29 was the, the SAC bomber during the Korean War. In fact, it dropped more high explosives over Korea than it did over Japan. So I think that may be of interest, a part so of So it did war. see combat oh, in the absolutely. Korean War. It sure mm -hmm. did. And uh, this airplane's last base was at Randolph in 1956. They moved it back to storage at China Lake uh, out in the Mojave I've been Desert. to China Lake. And, uh, I went up there looking for Poncho Barnes' restaurant, the one that burned down. Uh, not too far from there. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, it stayed there in storage from 56 until 71 when the Confederate Air Force got approval to, to get one airplane out of there. This is a little bit of a composite of five or six B-29s. They took the best parts and Cannibalized. pieces. Cannibalized. Yeah. Uh-huh. So um, we uh, sent a crew of 10 people to the desert, and in 100 days, they flew this airplane out of the desert nonstop to Harlingen, Texas at that time. The that flight was, of the Phoenix. You yeah, remember that? Just about. Uh -huh. And then we worked on it for three years thereafter, and, uh, and then uh, we had uh, there's a long story about trying to get it approved for flying from the military because uh, no airplane that the military loans a museum like we were is supposed to be a flyable airplane. They're all supposed to be static displays. And uh, the man who, our benefactor who got this out of the desert, uh, he wanted a flying airplane, a B-29, that flew. And, well, uh, that's so something we need to mention. This is the only flying B-29 in the world. That's correct. That is correct. And uh, so he went to Washington. He got in touch with Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater called the chief of staff of the Air Force. 
And uh, the man says, our man says, you could see the back of his neck, Barry's neck getting very red. And he says, what he said to the chief, he can't repeat. But uh, he, after he hung up, he said, go over to the Pentagon, the airplane is yours. So uh, this is how we made it a flying airplane. The Air Force took it out of their, their inventory in order for us to have a flyable airplane. Well, we're very happy that you brought it here to share with us this weekend. Uh, in closing, is there anything else you'd like to tell our viewers about the Confederate Air Force? Well, we're an organization of roughly uh, 8,000 people. Uh, we were established. Members, 8,000 uh, members. 8,000 uh. members. We're all volunteers. The people you see out here that are working are all volunteers. We're not compensated in any way, and we spend a lot of our own money to come out, work on these airplanes, keep them flying, move them. And uh, this is what our organization is all about, is the love of these wonderful airplanes that were built from the war years 1939 through 1945. And the present generation is out spray painting graffiti, damaging property, while you're putting your own time, your own money, your own energy into preserving history. That's, that's correct. And that's There's a, a message too. there. That's, that's a shame also, yeah. But, uh, we're we're having a great stop here in San Diego, and uh, we're just very happy to have the people come out and see a part of our history. Uh, this beautiful P-51, what a great fighter it was, the greatest trainer in the world, the T-6, and our B-29, and our old Liberator, the oldest of the three still flying in the world today. So there's something for, for everyone to see here. Every time I take off, and I look down at the earth, I say, thank you, Lord, for letting me be a pilot. Right. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Fifi, a World War II and Korean War B-29 bomber. What an airplane. Recently, the most famous B-29, the Enola Gay, went on display at the Smithsonian Institute to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the flight that dropped the first atomic bomb. The public was astonished to discover that the people in charge of the exhibit had changed and distorted history to promote their own views and agenda. In response to public outrage, the falsehoods were eliminated, but the incident exemplifies revisionist history. Those who will, if permitted, change and slant the atrocities committed against Americans in World War II. When the Enola Gay and the atomic bomb were ready for deployment, President Truman sent a message to Hirohito through the Swiss Embassy, telling him that we had a new weapon that would destroy everything within a 25-mile radius and to save the lives of his own Japanese people to please surrender. Hirohito's answer was, no, absolutely not. So the B-29, Enola Gay, dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. President Truman contacted Hirohito again and asked him, in order to save Japanese lives, please surrender. Hirohito's answer was, no, absolutely not. So the B-29 boxcar dropped another atomic bomb on Nagasaki. President Truman again contacted Hirohito and asked him to surrender for humanitarian reasons to save lives. Hirohito's answer was no, absolutely not. President Truman then sent a message saying no more military targets. The next atomic bomb is coming down the chimney of your imperial palace. The next target is you. Seven hours after receiving the message, Japan surrendered. The cowards who planned and carried out the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor had been beaten by America, thanks in part to the creation of the Boeing B-29, an airplane that we have been fortunate to see today. And in just a moment, we're going to see this B-29, Fifi, the only flying B-29 in the world, take off.
This is a Stearman. The pilots who flew the B-29s flew the Stearman as their basic primary trainer. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to see the only flying B-29 in the world take to the sky. Thank <laughs> you. 